So, so by now we know all the building blocks uh, of this approach. So now one should just put them together and see what, uh, what follows. So let us consider a, a four-point function of four identical uh, scalar fields. And uh, as, as we discussed last time, uh, the, this four-point function, okay, it's going to be proportional to some function of ZZ bar, which, is, uh, which can be expanded into conformal blocks, so FK squared P delta K LK ZZ bar. And, uh, and there has to be an equation satisfied by this function g. Uh, so 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar uh, to the power delta phi, p z z bar, uh, minus uh, z going to z bar has to be equal to 0. So we take this expansion and we we put it into this equation, and we get some equation for, uh, for uh, dimensions delta k, uh, lk, and for this coefficients fk squared. Uh, and uh, so, by the way, notice that uh, out of this infinitely many terms, so this is going to be uh, infinitely many terms and this sum, there is one term which is known, which is, uh, which is the coefficient of the unit operator. So we, are, we, we normalize our fields uh, by saying that the two-point function is equal to 1 over r to the power to delta phi. So it's just normalization. And this means that if you take the OPE phi times phi, the phi, phi of x, phi of 0, so this, this OPE is, uh, is, includes uh, infinitely many operators, but it also includes the unit operator with the coefficient equal to 1. This is just a normalization. Plus, so let's separate the OPE into the unit operator plus all the other operators with the coefficients that we don't know. Plus derivatives. So, so what I'm saying here is that in this equation, there's going to be uh, the uh, one term that we know, which is the one corresponding to the, to the unit operator. By the way, the conformal block of the unit operator is just one. So uh, for uh, so conformal block G of the unit operator, ZZ bar is just equal to one identically. Because the unit operator has no descendants. It, uh, the derivative of the interpreter is zero, so its conformal block consists of just one term. So in this equation, then, there is one term that you know, which is the one corresponding to the unit operator, and all the other terms that we don't know. And, uh, well, uh, it's a natural question to ask, what can we learn about all these other operators, OK, and their OP coefficients, uh, you know, given, given uh, for example, the dimension of the field phi. So is there, anything, is there anything general that you can say about, uh, about operators appearing in the OP? Uh, well, um, it's not a priori clear because, you see, uh, it's an equation. Uh, there are infinitely many unknowns here. Uh, all f's are unknowns, all delta k's are unknowns. And uh, um, it's not a priori clear how, this, uh, how constraining this equation is. Not clear. So uh, actually, um, the way 
the progress has been achieved. Um, so there are two ways, there are two ways uh, you can uh, try to approach uh, this problem. One way would be uh, to just um, try to solve this equation. You know, try, try, let's try to solve uh, some f's and deltas, f k's and delta k's, which solve this equation. Well, that's a very hard problem because uh, you have infinitely many unknowns. Uh, so th this problem basically is not, it's not known how to solve it. Uh, so this problem has not yet been solved. But then there is a more modest, then there's a more modest way to approach this problem, which is to say, uh, you know, there is this whole, there is this whole space of CFT data. So there is a CFT data, which is uh, Fs and deltas. Uh, can we use this equation, like for, for starters, uh, to rule out some parts of this big space? Now, for example, can we get the result of, of the type that there is like a big chunk of the CFT data, uh, which would be uh, inconsistent? Something like some result of this type. Actually, uh, we can even we can even uh, put the question somewhat differently. So let's suppose let's let's make some assumptions. So let's make some assumptions about the spectrum. Let's make some assumptions about delta case. The kind of assumptions, uh, I mean, you can make different assumptions. Well, let me give you one example of assumption. I mean, let, let, me, let me make a very stupid assumption. Let's assume that uh, delta k is equal to some constant. Let me, let's assume delta k is equal to k. That, that would be one very silly uh, but possible assumption. So now we fix the spectrum. Delta k is equal to k. Now, once the spectrum is fixed, you can view this equation as an equation for f squared. And now, uh, so once you, so this is an example, right? So now uh, we have unknowns. So once the spectrum is fixed, the unknowns are. Uh, pk equal fk squared. Well, let me call them xk. xk like fk squared are the unknowns. So the important point is that all of these unknowns have to be positive, has to have to be non-negative numbers. So one question that you can ask is, uh, you know, does this equation seen as an equation for xk's have a solution such that all xk's are positive. Well, this is already a more concrete, uh, a more concrete question, and uh, you can imagine that uh, one can try to make uh, progress on this question. So this becomes a kind of a, a problem of linear algebra. Well, it's not yet, uh, it's not yet uh, in the form that you can put on a computer because, you see, uh, if the problems that we can put on the computer, if you have some vectors and matrices and so on, but here we have functions. So in order to put this problem on a computer, you have to somehow come up uh, with a way, uh, you know, to, to take this problem for functions and translate it into, into a problem for uh, for vectors and for matrices. And uh, one way uh, to do this would be to say, well, um, you know, this equation has to be satisfied for all z's and z bars. Right? But let me just pick a finite number of points 
z, uh, let me just pick some finite number of points, z i, and require, instead of requiring that uh, this equation is satisfied for all z's and z bars, I'm just going to require that it's satisfied for this uh, finite number of points. So here we go. Instead of having a problem for functions, we have a problem for vectors. Uh, the length of the vector is equal to uh, the number of points that we chose. So of course, this is going to be uh, a necessary condition so that the equation be satisfied for each zi, it's a necessary condition, not necessarily a sufficient condition. But if, if you take more and more points, then uh, you, you will be uh, approaching uh, more and more uh, to, the, to the original equation for all z's and z-bars. Instead of uh, picking different points, you can, uh, you can take a different strategy. You can pick one particular point, for example, z equal one half. So this was one strategy is many points. Another strategy is that pick one particular point, say z equal one half, and uh, uh, Taylor expand up to some uh, finite order up to some large order, lambda. And then impose that to each order in the stellar expansion, uh, this equation be satisfied. Again, you are going to get a finite dimensional uh, system of equations. And then, uh, so, so what do you see? Uh, if you do this trick, if you do this truncation, you have a finite dimensional system of equations, but you still have infinitely many unknowns because the spectrum contains infinitely many operators, at least in this example that, that we chose, right? So uh, if you did not have this constraint that xk have to be positive, then basically you would always find a solution. And so the solution would always exist. But with this constraint that uh, xk have to be positive, it turns out that uh, it's not always possible to find a solution. Even though you have infinitely many operators, uh, you cannot, you do not necessarily can find uh, coefficients so that they all sum uh, to the contribution given by the unit operator. So you see the contribution given by the unit operator, you can see it as the, as the right-hand side contribution, and you have to reproduce it by, uh, by all this, uh, by all the other operators with positive coefficients. So this is not, uh, this is not always uh, going to be possible. Uh, that's clear. Um, but, you know, uh, you can try to come up with, uh, with geometrical pictures for that, but you can also view it as a, as a, as a, as a numerical problem which you can put on a computer and uh, analyze on a computer. And the reason why it's possible to analyze it on a computer because uh, it turns out that problems involving linear inequalities like this one, that xk uh, larger than uh, xk have to be positive, it's a linear inequality. It turns out that uh, numerically problems involving linear inequalities can be solved on a computer uh, almost as quickly as problems involving uh, linear equalities. So we all, in the, in, in the courses of linear algebra, uh, we study linear equations. Uh, but it turns out that there is a chapter of linear algebra which involves linear inequalities, uh, which is not, uh, unfortunately, is not, uh, is not usually studied in basic courses of linear algebra, but there are algorithms for solving problems involving linear inequalities, which are almost as efficient as the ones involving linear inequalities. For example, there's one algorithm which is called uh, simplex method. Uh, which allows you uh, to, to, this, to decide whether the problem has a solution or not. There was a question there.
Excuse me? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, it's Z going to 1 minus Z, yeah. And Z bar going to 1 minus Z bar. Thank you. So, so this is the core logic of, uh, of this numerical approach. So you have non-perturbative ingredients, the conformal blocks. Then you make some assumption about the spectrum, and you ask whether this assumption is consistent with crossing symmetry or not. But you know, this assumption about the spectrum that I gave here as an example, of course, is a very stupid assumption. And uh, I mean, this is not an interesting assumption in practice. But you can come up with, uh, with, with more interesting assumptions. So let me give you an example of, of a more interesting assumption. So, uh, So let me let me uh, draw so sigma so phi times phi op. Let me split this op so there's a unit operator of the p, and then there are uh, operators of pin zero. Then uh, there are operators of spin two, pin four, and so on. When you take the OP of two identical scalar operators, then only operators of even spin are going to appear in this OP uh, just because of, uh, of, of the symmetry under the interchange of, of the two fields. So what can we say about the dimensions of, this, of these operators, spin 2, spin 4, and so on? So, for example, among the spin two operators, there's going to be the stress tensor operator, T mu nu, which has, uh, which has dimension of D. So the, the stress tensor operator in any conformal field theory has dimension exactly equal to the space-time dimension, D. And then, uh, so moreover, it turns out that all, so it's not going to be the only spin two operator in this OP. There are going to be infinitely many spin two operators, but in uh, unitary theories, all other operators are going to have dimension larger than the, than the stress tensor operator. So it's going to be the stress tensor plus operators uh, of dimension larger than D. So this is called the unitarity bound. So the unitarity bound tells you that for each spin, there is the minimal allowed dimension, uh, allowed dimension which is consistent with unitarity. So actually, the unitarity bound says that the dimension of the operator of spin L uh, has to be larger than or equal than D plus L minus two uh, this is for spin L equal uh, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And then for, for spin 0, delta 0 is, has to be larger than or equal than uh, D over 2 minus 1. So this is the dimension of the free scalar operator, D over 2 minus 1. So what the entirety bound says is that the dimension of uh, in an interacting theory, the dimension of a scalar operator can only be larger than in a free theory. So this is for scalars. And uh, so analogously, in, uh, for other spins, the free scalar theory contains uh, the stress tensor operator, but it also contains this... Uh, conserved currents of, uh, of higher spin. And the dimension of this conserved currents is equal to D plus, uh, equal to L plus D minus two. And what this unitarity bound says is that in an interacting theory, uh, the dimensions can only go up. So in particular, so you know that for spin two, all the dimensions are going to be larger than or equal to D. Uh, for spin four, you know that the dimensions are going to be larger than uh, D plus two, and so on. 
And so I'm going to make the following assumption about the spectrum. For spin two, four, and so on, I'm not going to make any assumption apart from the one following from the unitarity bound, which is not an assumption. It's just an assumption of unitarity. So here I'm assuming unitarity bounds. But for spin zero, I'm going to make a separate assumption. For spin zero, I'm going to make an assumption that all dimensions d, delta here, are larger. So, I'm, so let me say, uh, let me call the first operator, the lowest dimension operator in the SUP, let me call it, uh, I mean, let me call this operator epsilon. So this is the lowest dimension operator. So epsilon of dimension delta epsilon. And then uh, plus higher dimension operators. So basically, my assumption is going to be quantified, but what the dimension of this operator epsilon is. So if, if this delta epsilon is uh, equal to the free scalar dimension that, okay, then I'm not making any assumption, but if I'm starting to push this delta epsilon up, then, uh, then I'm making a stronger and stronger assumption. And the question that I would like to ask is whether any value of delta epsilon is allowed. Is this a clear, clear question? So I'm assuming that epsilon is the lowest dimension scalar, and I'm assuming uh, I'm, I'm taking some I'm taking its dimension to be equal to delta epsilon, right? and I would like to ask whether this is allowed. So I'm going to now uh, for each value of delta epsilon, I can ask a question whether this equation has a solution involving epsilon of dimension delta epsilon and involving all other operators about which I will not going to assume anything except that they have to lie, you know, for, for spin zero, they have to lie above epsilon and for spin two, four, and so on, they have to lie above the unitarity bounds. This is the, the question that I would like to ask. And this, as I explained, uh, this question can be analyzed on a computer. Is this, uh, any questions about the question? And uh, okay, you can, uh, so you can basically, uh, analytically, you can understand that there is going to be uh, an upper bound on the allowed value of delta epsilon. So I'm not going to explain this. You can, you can look this up in the notes. But basically, if you look uh, at the conformal blocks, so this, this I, I explained to you what is the structure of conformal blocks, that they have a certain uh, expansion in terms of this variable rho, and so on. So if you use this structure, then you can show rigorously that there is an upper bound on the allowed value of delta epsilon. The delta epsilon cannot be arbitrarily large. So I'm not, I'm not going to explain this, uh, how it comes about, but you, you can look this up. But, uh, you know, once you know that there is this bound, the bound that you're going to get analytically is going to be a crude bound. You can only, sh you can only prove the existence. But if you really uh, want to compute the exact value of this bound, then you have to do the analysis on a computer. Uh, and uh, when you do this analysis, you discover, uh, you discover amazing things. So let me show you. Uh, you can do this analysis in any number of dimensions. You can do this analysis, for example, in two, in two dimensions. Uh, so, so let me explain, uh, let me explain this plot. So in this plot, on the horizontal axis, 
is the dimension of this phi operator with which I start. You know, this operator in the left-hand side of the OP, right? So I vary the dimension of phi, and then for each value of the dimension, I am uh, computing an upper bound on the dimension of this operator epsilon. Well, here it's called delta zero. Delta zero is the maximal allowed value on the dimension of the operator epsilon. So, so you get a curve. Actually, here I have several curves, as you can see. And uh, uh, they are numbered by this parameter lambda. Well, this is this uh, truncation parameter. I told you that when you, when you do this numerical analysis, you either choose a, a certain number of points or you choose a certain number of derivatives. And so this parameter lambda is uh, numbers how many derivatives you included your analysis. And as you see, as you increase lambda, then the bound that you get gets stronger and stronger until it converges to some line. You know, this, this uh, thick blue line is the limit of the bound when you take uh, lambda going to infinity. And so all points above this line here, this white region, are excluded. So uh, in other words, we know rigorously that there cannot be any unitary conformable theory in two dimensions which lies, which has the dimension phi, say, 0.1, and the dimension epsilon, 1.5. There is no such conformable theory, period. Well, this is already, by itself, this is an interesting result. Because even in two dimensions, uh, even in two dimensions, OK, in two dimensions, we know a lot about conformable field theories. Uh, but uh, we know, uh, especially, a lot about a particular class of two-dimensional conformal field theories, which are called rational conformal field theories, which uh, have finitely many primary fields. So this is a subclass of conformal field theories. Uh, and uh, you know, if you relax this assumption, then uh, we know significantly less. So this result is completely general. It does not use, uh, it applies to both rational and irrational conformal field theories. So this is already interesting. But another interesting thing which transpires in this analysis is that uh, you, know, it's, you can ask, well, OK, you derived some numerical bound. But in order to make sure that you do not make any stupid mistake, well, we should uh, look, uh, how about some conformal field theories which we know exist? Uh, do they satisfy this bound? For example, let's take these rational conformal field theories, which are uh, where we know the dimensions of operators. Do they satisfy this bound or not? Well, you discover that uh, they do satisfy the bound. Moreover, uh, some of these theories, they actually saturate the bound. For example, the, the two-dimensional easing CFT, it lies uh, at this point. And uh, uh, the other minimal model CFTs, which describe tricritical uh, and multicritical easy models, these are the CFTs M, M M plus one, they also lie along this line, so these points. But but particularly interesting is the is the easy model CFT because it lies at this corner point. So. Uh, well, uh, well, this is remarkable because so why is this remarkable? Because uh, we are looking for a method which would be applicable uh, to all dimensions at the same time, right? So there are all these beautiful two-dimensional methods, but they are really applicable only in two dimensions. We don't know how to extend them to higher dimensions. And here is a method. It's a numerical method, but it's applicable for all dimensions. Uh, and yet we see that in two dimensions, it, it allows us to single out the, the, some CFTs, for example, the easing model CFT. So now, uh, well, the natu natural next step is to say, well, now let's take this method and apply it in three dimensions and see what, uh, what's going to happen. Uh, for example, are we going to, to single out the three-dimensional easing model CFT 
uh, if you just repeat exactly the same analysis in three dimensions and not in two dimensions? A very natural question to ask. Yes. There are many things which are special about the two-dimensional easy model, but uh, which one of these things is responsible for producing this cusp is uh, um, well, one, one uh, there are several answers to this question, but one answer is the following. So you see, uh, there is this line which interpolates all the minimal models. So it means that there exists a one parameter family of four point functions which solve crossing symmetry, which for some special values of this parameter, they reduce to the minimal models and then you interpolate and then you arrive to the, to the easy model. So actually, uh, we know, we know this analytically, you know, this plot was produced numerically, but the, the four point functions which describe this line, they are known also analytically. So you can ask, well, uh, you know, l let's look at this analytic solution here and ask, well, what, why can't we just go, keep going? Why can't we just continue this analytic solution to below the easy model? Well, the, the answer is clear. So if you take this analytic solution, you expand it in conformal blocks, each OP coefficient, you can derive analytically what it's going to be. But now, as you continue delta, you find that at this particular value, one of these OP coefficients goes to zero because the easing model uh, has uh, certain null states. Norms of these states uh, are equal to zero. And so the, the coefficients, so the contributions corresponding to the states, they disappear at the easing model point. So if you were to take this solution and continue even to smaller values of, of delta phi, then this coefficient will become negative. But we are imposing the condition that all coefficients have to be positive. So it's clear that at this point, this line should terminate. To terminate and you have to switch to some other regime. And analogously, you can show that, okay, here, unfortunately, here, we don't know the analytic solution. So we can, but we can follow uh, numerically uh, the solution to crossing symmetry corresponding to this branch. And again, you see that the same thing happens. So there is this solution. And as you come to this point, there is one OP coefficient which becomes zero, and you cannot continue it. So, th so there is this crossover phenomenon. Yes. There are many points which lie inside the route region. Yeah. Well, minimal models has, ma ha has many OPEs, right? So some of these OPEs, depending on which field you choose phi, you call phi and which one epsilon, some of these OPEs, they, they lie on, uh, on the line and other OPEs, they lie inside the allowed region. You know, free theory, in free theory, you can find OPEs which lie along this. In free scalar theory, you can find OPEs lying along this line. Yes? Um, it's not fully understood. I mean, Intuitively, you say, well, it's because uh, minimal models, they, um, so you, the, the, there are many ways to arrive at the minimal models in the usual two-dimensional way. So, uh, for example, one way to derive minimal models is to say that these are the unique models uh, of center charge smaller than one, which are unitary. This, this models M, M plus one. This is completely an uh, algebraic way. So um, there are many states in this minimal models which are null. Now, all this logic does not exactly go through. Uh, the, the, it's not exactly clear what corresponds to this logic in our numerical approach. Because in this approach, we are not using the Verasor algebra. We are only using SL2C, only a subgroup of the Verasor algebra. And yet, 
the, you, you, what you find is that uh, the spectrum along this line of states, it organizes uh, itself in the Virasoro multiplets. So, uh, it's consistent, but it does not really explain uh, the, the, the reason behind it. So, I think the answer is that it's not fully understood. But let me show you now the three-dimensional results. So, uh, so if you do this in, uh, in three dimensions, then um, you find, uh, again, numerically, uh, this plot. And uh, you, you see that this plot, again, uh, is similar to this plot in the fact that it has, again, an allowed region for small dimensions, a disallowed region, and it has a corner point again. Well, in this plot, this, this corner point is not uh, very sharp. It has, uh, it, it's a bit smoothed out. But actually, the, the, positions, the position of this corner point, when we first produced this plot, uh, we were very happy because the position of this corner point actually did agree with the known dimensions of operators sigma and epsilon in the three-dimensional using mole CFT. So, because, because uh, as I mentioned to you, there are several ways to arrive at these operator dimensions. Even before we started developing these CFT methods, there are people already did Monte Carlo simulations, and uh, they tried to resum perturbation theory. So it was known more or less with some not very good but uh, reasonable precision uh, that these dimensions, they take such and such values. And those values agreed with the position of this corner point. So uh, this is really remarkable because you see, uh, when I was explaining to you the bootstrap philosophy, I was said, well, if we impose this bootstrap equation for all correlation functions, for all four-point correlation functions, then uh, we should be able to single out uh, the consistent conformal field theories in any number of dimensions. But here we are not imposing the bootstrap equation for all correlation functions. We are imposing it for just one correlation function, phi, 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 and yet, uh, it turns out that for this three-dimensional easy mole CFT, this seems to be sufficient uh, to fix it. If you believe in this corner point story. Uh, so, um, so that was four years ago, and then uh, the question then was, uh, how to improve the precision. So here, the, the corner point is not very precise, and we wanted to, uh, we wanted to, um, to get the operator dimensions of, of these two operators uh, with, a, with a good precision. And uh, we found uh, an interesting twist in this story, which we called uh, C-minimization. So uh, let me explain what this means. Basically, the, the point is the following. So we, we, we have evidence that the easing model lies uh, in the corner point, in the corner point of the space of CFT data. So it's a special point. There is a CFT data, and the easing model seems to lie at the corner point. Now, uh, how do you get to a corner point? Well, in order to get to a corner point, you can, uh, you can imagine by starting from the space of CFT data, 
and you can try to push in such direction. For example, okay, we can suppose that you, you, you start from this, view it like this. Imagine that uh, there is a wind, there is a wind blowing in this direction. So you start from uh, this uh, space of safety data and you follow the wind. And if the wind blows in the right direction, then you're going to, to end up in the corner point. But there is a, the corner point solves many optimization problems. It, that's, uh, there is a range, you expect that there is a range of optimization problems. There's not a unique, so we, we found one optimization problem, which is this optimization of delta epsilon, which brings you to the corner point. But there may be other optimization problems which also bring you to the corner point. And it's not clear that the, the, the uh, epsilon optimization is the most natural uh, optimization problem. What would be a more natural optimization problem uh, for, for the easing model, specific to the easing model? Well, there is one natural quantity that you may want to optimize, which is the central charge. It is a natural quantity because it's known that in two dimensions, the two-dimensional easing model is the unitary conformal field theory with the smallest possible value of the central charge, C equal one half. So in 2D, C equal one half is the smallest possible value for the unitary theory, and this is a rigorously known result. Now, what about three dimensions? In three dimensions, uh, in three dimensions, first of all, uh, what is what is the center of charge in three dimensions? So, in two dimensions, there are many possible definitions of the center of charge. You can define the center of charge through the Virasoro algebra. You can define the center of charge through the Weyl anomaly. Uh, you can uh, define it through the stress tensor OPE, and all these definitions they give you the same center of charge, C. Now, when you are in three dimensions, uh, not all of these definitions make sense. For example, while anomaly doesn't make sense because there's no anomaly in, uh, in, in odd dimensions. Uh, Virasoro algebra definition also, you lose it because there is no extended algebra. So the only definition of the center of charge uh, which generalizes naturally to three dimensions is the OPE definition. So if you take, uh, if you take the, the two-point correlation function of the stress tensor, T mu nu, T lambda sigma, then in two dimensions, uh, this is proportional to, to the center charge. And let's take this also as a, as a definition of the center charge in three dimensions as well. So it's going to be CT over X to the six times some tensor structure. Let me take it as a definition of the center of charge in, uh, in 3D. Now this definition is, um, is not totally useless, it's useful. Because, so by the way, notice, uh, in, uh, for other fields, I said that I'm going to normalize the two-point function to one. For the stress tensor, I did not normalize it to one. I kept this normalization CT. And the reason is that for the stress tensor, the natural normalization is through the void identities. So the stress tensor has already a natural normalization uh, through the void identities. And that's why uh, it's useful to keep the center charge explicit. But if you use the word identities, then you can show that, uh, that the OPE, so we are considering this, you know, what is the OPE coefficient of the stress tensor in the OPE phi phi? So this OPE coefficient is going to be equal to uh, delta, delta phi, divided by um, 
square root of CT. Timu tilde. So Timu is the central charge which is normalized canonically, and Timu tilde is the no, not central charge, the stress tensor, and Timu tilde is the stress tensor rescaled to have its two-point function one. And then I'm claiming that this uh, OPE coefficient for such normalization is going to be delta phi divided by square root of CT. So delta phi is just uh, follows from the word identities because the word identities are going to involve the dimension of the field phi. And this, uh, you know, the, you can figure out this, uh, the correct normalization of the central charges. It's the one that, uh, that I'm giving you here. Um, so the, the, the physical meaning of this is the following. Uh, if you take a theory with a very large central charge, then the stress tensor is going to, to contribute less and less to the four-point function of scalar operators. This, for example, is the situation in, uh, for theories, uh, large end theories with ADS duals. Because there, uh, you know, if you're familiar with ADS story, there, the center charge contribution or the, the stress tensor contribution, which you describe using uh, the gravity in the bulk, is 1 over n suppressed. So in the limit of large center charge, stress tensor decouples. If, on the other hand, you take a limit of small center charge, then the stress tensor contribution becomes larger and larger. And so you can expect that there's going to be some inconsistency. So if the stress, if the center charge is too small, then, uh, you know, the, the, this stress tensor contribution is going to be huge. And you may expect that uh, it's going to be inconsistent with the crossing symmetry. Because the crossing symmetry says that, uh, you know, all contributions have to be more or less of the same order of magnitude, and then they... Uh, combine with each other, and the sum is going to be crossing symmetric. But if one of the contributions is too big, well, then uh, it might be impossible to, to satisfy crossing symmetry. Well, this is just an intuitive argument. So now you, you can ask, you can try to make this intuitive argument precise. You can say, well, given delta phi, what is the smallest possible number, what is the, the smallest possible value of the center of charge consistent with crossing symmetry? This question is, once again, amenable to this numerical analysis that, I'm, uh, that I described. It's uh, by exactly the same algorithm. So you do this numerical analysis, and lo and behold, you find that uh, this is true. So you find that, again, uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this plot, in which on the horizontal axis, OK, I, I plot delta phi dimension. Uh, and on the vertical axis, I plot the allowed value of the center charge, normalized to the free scale of center charge. This is in three dimensions. And you find that this bound has a minimum. Again, okay, the, here the minimum is not very sharp, but this minimum is located precisely where the three-dimensional ESIG model is supposed to, to be located. So this... Uh, this plot, this numerical plot, it gives uh, evidence for the conjecture that the three-dimensional using model CFT is the smallest center of charge CFT, unitary CFT in three dimensions. <coughs> and, uh, you know, once we made this conjecture, we, we then uh, pushed the numerical, pushed the numerical analysis, and uh, we were able to determine the, uh, the position of this minimum precisely enough to, you know, to get the dimension of sigma operator, which is the, the phi, the one that I call phi, with many digits uh, and uh, the center of charge with many digits. And moreover, you know, when you go to the minimum, then, of course, when you go to the minimum, then the dimension of, at the minimum, the dimension of sigma is fixed because that's the minimum. The dimension of uh, the, the center charge is also fixed, but it turns out that the, the, the dimensions and the OP coefficients of all the other operators are also fixed. 
because the minimum is an extremal point. If you want to reach the minimum, then all the parameters have to be fine-tuned uh, to take precise values. So you basically know everything. So if, if you take this assumption that the easing model lives at the minimum, then, uh, then this gives you an algorithm to determine all CFT data of the three-dimensional easing model, CFT. Any questions about this? So, so this was a few years ago, and then, uh, uh, then what happened is that, well, this is plausible that that the minimal that the easing model has to have the minimal stutter charge, but uh, strictly speaking, this is still an assumption. So it was. Uh, it would be nice to find a way uh, to justify this assumption. Justify this assumption. This uh, has not yet been done. But uh, what has been done is that uh, we found a way to get rid of this assumption completely. So we found a way to do the analysis which is free of any unproven assumptions, at least for the three-dimensional easy model. <coughs> and, um, okay, I, I'm not sure I have time to talk about this, but let me just say a few words. So basically, uh, as I said, you know, here, the amazing thing of this analysis is that we are just studying one correlation function and we're already learning a lot. But what if we studied several correlation functions together? So, for example, this uh, three-dimensional easing model CFT has two lowest dimension operators, sigma and epsilon. And up to now, we only studied one correlation function, sigma, 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 sigma. Why can't we study all possible correlation functions of sigma and epsilon together? You know, surely we will learn more if you do this. And, uh, and so... Uh, it turns out that if you study uh, these three correlation functions together, then, uh, then uh, not only do you learn more, but you basically fix the model. Uh, you basically fix the model absolutely. So this is another amazing property of, of the, um, the three-dimensional easing model. So let me say, explain just in words what, uh, what this plot means. So you, you take these three correlation functions, you study them together, and you say for which values of these two operators, uh, the crossing symmetry equation for all three correlation functions is consistent. So if you do this, then you find that, uh, so we had these big allowed regions and a priori, all points inside those regions were consistent, and only uh, the angular point was consistent with the easing model. But now, uh, now it turns out if you study three correlation functions, that all of this, you know, a, a big chunk of this allowed region goes away, and you are just left with a small island around, uh, around the easing point. And uh, here, you're already not making any assumption, no C-minimization, no whatsoever, just, uh, just crossing symmetry. And, uh, and then, okay, then uh, this analysis was pushed uh, a bit further up, and, uh, and basically it led to this uh, currently mostly pre most precise definition of operator dimensions in uh, in the three-dimensional easing model using this bootstrap method. So anyway, this was a bit uh, fast a a review of, of the numerical techniques. But, well, that's as much as I could do in the time I had. I think I'll stop here. <laughs>